Data philanthropy is but one thread in an emerging polyphony of perspectives around the use of personal data. Today's panelists are two of the leading voices in these debates, and I'm grateful to both of them for joining us here today to help us understand how we got here, where we are, and where this might go. You may also find, as I did, that their perspectives are unique and challenge some of your basic assumptions about data and privacy. Bill Hoffman leads the World Economic Forum's telecommunications industry group, where he supports a global community of industry partners in addressing some of the world's most pressing economic, social, and environmental challenges. Prior to joining the World Economic Forum, Bill was director of enterprise marketing at at and Jane Yakowitz is a visiting assistant professor at Brooklyn Law School. Her research interests include privacy law, the legal profession, and empirical legal studies. She previously served as the, served as the director of Project CFI, Scale and Effects of Admissions Preferences in Higher Education at UCLA School of Law. Professor Yakovitz has negotiated complex public records disclosures and has prepared large de-identified, de-identified databases for public release. If we could welcome uh, Bill and Jane. So thank you for joining us today. Um, Bill, you were a co-author of the World Economic Forum's uh, new report entitled Personal Data, the Emergence of a New Asset Class earlier this year. Could you tell us more about the opportunities that you see for personal data, both socially and economically? Sure. Um, And just to set the stage just a little bit, uh, the World Economic Forum, some of you may know us from the annual meeting in Davos that we have. And at its core, it's a multi-stakeholder organization, which is um, aspirational in its belief that there's some win-win-win solutions across the public sector, private sector, and individuals for some of the world's toughest challenges. And so in looking at some of the challenges, one of, at least from my perspective, one of the most compelling uh, opportunities was in leveraging this ubiquitous $5 billion and counting uh, ICT infrastructure that's out there. And so the discussions have evolved in the sense of um, making sure that that infrastructure is sustainable, that it's affordable, uh, things that we've all heard and discussed in industry discussions for 10, 15 years. But what's emerged out of that dialogue was probably the most important, if you will, thing to get right was the data and understanding that that is what we've created now. Um, One of the individuals we work with, Sandy Pentland from MIT, coined the phrase, it's our digital nervous system. And understanding how to leverage the agility, uh, the resilience, the intelligence, how to act at global scale is unprecedented. So that's great. And you can wave your arms around and get very excited about those buzzwords. But where the dialogue went from our perspective was to really anchor on the principles of what that means and understand specifically what principles do we need to make sure carry over into the digital realm that may or may not, you know, from our physical world. And so that leads, leads you to a, a relatively important discussion on the rights and needs of the individual. So core to the report we work and the dialogue we have It's around user centricity, which is a term with a lot of baggage to it and there's semantic issues. But at the end of the day, it's about the people. And how do we ensure that the rights people enjoy today in terms of property rights, civil rights, um, economic rights, carry over into the digital realm? And so that's been the lens that we've been looking at to foster a a richer and richer dialogue. Um, And that's what we're up to. Very good. Thank you. And, and Jane, in your paper on the tragedy of the data commons, you outline the tremendous value of uh, this new data for public policy. But privacy ar- advocates argue that there's no safe way to share private data. Are there fears founded, or is there a middle ground here? Yeah, so, so the policy and law community is increasingly anxious over these uh, building data troves and even de-identified data that is intended to be used for research purposes is seen as um, potentially risky for the data subjects. The idea is that 
as more and more information becomes available about us on the internet or in commercially available profile uh, databases, uh, these types of resources can be linked to de-identified information in order to reveal the identities of the underlying data subjects. Uh, and, and so I've, I've argued that the risk is actually not as, as great as we as, as you might be led to believe, even with these new sources of information. And this is uh, it, the, the sort of very quick explanation, is that there is no publicly available, um, accurate uh, um, sort of database that describes all of our features. And so even a very sophisticated hack will get some false matches because there's no way to know whether there are other people that share these characteristics. And so even a sophisticated attack, which, which takes a lot of effort too, um, is, uh, is, is unlikely to be very clean or it will be sort of riddled with error. Um, now, the common ground so far for, for research context has been anonymization. When, when data is properly anonymized, and that's a big if, um, it, it, these attacks are, are somewhat difficult to perform. Um, and, I, and I do think that that's still a, f a fairly good middle ground, as you call it. Or put another way, if we don't share research data, we're really shooting ourselves in the foot because we know for sure that the data is very highly useful for social research and, and policy research and health research, too. Um, and so far, at least, these truly nefarious attacks that we're imagining are, are theoretical. We don't, we don't know that they've happened at all yet. Uh, and there are other there are other policies though that could that could bolster uh, sharing for research purposes. So uh, licensing agreements, such that, so that um, a registered researcher promises not to re-release the data, for example, might might diminish the probability of an attack. Or uh, you know, a really straightforward uh, um, policy that I think could, could be helpful here is is just sanctioning anybody who does re-identify a data subject for for an improper purpose. Of course, the detection is difficult, but it, but it seems like common sense to at least add that to our, our policy initiatives. So. And you've, you've compared uh, the, the risk to a kind of herd immunity problem, in a sense, with vaccinations, right? Right, yeah. If, if, if we believe that we're shouldering a little bit of risk, which even I concede we do. I mean, it's theoretical at this point, but there's some risk. Then uh, everybody has an incentive to hoard their data, but then hope that everyone else leaves their data in so that we get the indirect, you know, sort of help from research. Um, but, but we're very accustomed to sharing our information for... Uh, health purposes, you know, we, we know that the CDC collects, collects information that is about us, essentially, and, and education and, and employment context, too. Um, the EEOC uh, collects information to make sure that discrimination, uh, to, to check, you know, whether employers are discriminating, and, and we're in there. Um, so we're comfortable with it in some contexts, and, um, and I am urging people to feel a little more comfortable about expanding uh, our, our willingness to, to pool our data in, in de-identified form or in a form not expected to, um, to, to allow people to interact with us personally, but just to serve the sort of uh, a broader policy goal. Bill, what do you think? I mean, are there, are, what are you hearing uh, through the forum? Are, are there perceived advantages to companies uh, for sharing data? Do there, are there cases where they can? Do the benefits outweigh the risks? Sure, I think uh, the overall intuitive obviousness of sharing data comes through in multiple ways, but I think even larger is just all the intertwined risks. So there's technical, there's regulatory, there's political, there's end user, and, and they're all tied up. And I think in terms of where there's been progress, where there's been some support, is when you start to float the concept of, well, what if, similar to the medical industry or pharmaceutical industry, there was an environment, a safe harbor, where you could start to have some clinical trials so that these specific risks could be identified, you could start to operate, and that it could be done in a real-world context. So what we've heard from a number of people is to stop talking and start doing, that the technology is there, what's needed are the legal safe harbor as a way to come up with a way to minimize some of the liabilities so that the concepts, the value can be applied. And if there's a focused outcome too, which I think is also important, I think what's essential to the dialogue are the use cases and how you're going to apply it. That when we were chatting about this backstage, just people's natural reaction, if you talk about big data, we've all grown up being suspicious of big organizations. But if it's a value prop of let's start, stop, <laughs> let's stop 
um, disease outbreak before it happens because we know where the people are, we have this intelligent adaptive system, mm -hmm. then I think you just put people in a more willing and open environment. And that's what I think is also important to these safe harbors is some articulate um, use cases of a problem that we're trying to fix. And then from there, use those learnings to build up the next element. So I think just in terms of sequencing um, trials and understandings so that we can work and kind of shave away some of the, the global creep that's out there, I think would also be helpful to, to make some progress. Makes sense. Jane, what do you think? I, do, you, what is your perspective on this uh, personal data approach? Yeah, so, so the, the World Economic Forum's um, uh, uh, the, the sort of models that they're putting out are, um, uh, of course, quite appealing to me. Uh, on the other hand, I, I, I've written um, primarily about research data and de-identified data, but there are a lot of uses that both, both Global Pulse and, and WEF uh, anticipate that would not be in necessarily in de-identified form. So, you know, contributing your data in order to get something back is necessarily going to be... Um, a sort of recursive and 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 um, and not de-identified. Um, so one thing I like about the model, though, uh, I think we we might have some disagreement, perhaps, about how to treat de-identified uh, information. I, I I want to conceptually think of it as as not um, not an asset of any sort. You know, as facts that 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 should be um, put into a public domain and not charged for. And I'm not sure whether your model sort of um, um, allow us for that. Um, on the other hand, w one thing I really like about it is that I is, is that it, it's essentially a consent model. It doesn't use the <laughs> it doesn't use the terminology, but if users want to share their information um, in order to um, to benefit from it, then they are. It, it's sort of a really nice workaround from the potential collective action problem from the businesses that they mm -hmm. interact with. If users are are giving consent and and depositing their information directly into the system, we almost don't need to worry too much about the other stakeholders of the businesses because um, because um, whatever interest they have. In, in their own data, the user certainly can can sort of describe themselves to this um, to this uh, to, to, to this uh, pool and 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 allow it to sort of uh, function properly without without the consent of the businesses. Does that make some sense? Do you think it's possible to create a kind of safe data sharing sharing space where we're able to balance and protect both uh, the the privacy of individuals and the needs of government, for example? Um, and, and businesses all together in the same, the same architecture? Yeah, I think there's some, some interesting concepts, and you see it through the U.S. government from the, the NISTIC initiative, National Strategy for Trusted ID. Uh, there's work being done in the EU, EU around trust frameworks, accountability frameworks, where the usage and the, um, the liabilities and the duties are pre-assigned, and that what gets enforced is when there's a quote-unquote recognition event of the usage of the data. So it's less about let's try and tag every piece of data and come up with a rule set for that. But when data turns into information and there's value extracted, what are the liabilities, duties, responsibilities, what are the actors, how is consent managed? And that becomes the item where you start to understand is it consistent with agreed-upon policies. Because I think to a degree, just with the, the growth in data, trying to put our arms around that is going to be a very difficult and I'm not sure whether productive event. But if we can look at when there's a, a moment when it's used and there's value and it's combined, that's when there's, I think, an opportunity. So I think that's where you get um, the business sector waking up. I think language-wise, when you start to communicate the evolution of the personal data ecosystem in language that's very similar and represents, from my perspective, a lot of financial services, you know, highly secured personal data moves back and forth in the financial services every day, that gets people comfortable if you start to use the language of this is about securitization of an asset and here's how we can deal with it in that regard. That's the language where people start to wake up saying, ah, okay, so we need the marketplaces, we need to trade, we need to securitize it. Then they start to see it as an asset and less of a liability. Um, but I think the scale now, till, particularly for some of those that are sitting on big piles of data that are predominantly precluded from using it, there's still just you know, a big, big mountain of risks that need to be worked through before we can start to see someone I'll call real tangible kind of examples. 
which is why I think getting back to the work that you're doing in the global public sphere really starts to chip away at some of those concerns, that if we can start to articulate very important problems that have, you know, that velocity, have a global scale on it, that'll hopefully start to change people's minds of how you can use it in in one specific context. It's interesting to think about the kind of convergence of these two different approaches, because I think, you know, from our perspective, data philanthropy is something we want individuals ultimately to be able to engage in, not not simply corporations. And, you know, if you imagine a world one day of personal data vaults where you or I can gate third-party access selectively, um, you know, if people get behind this idea, then eventually you could get an emergent data commons in some sense that could serve both public good uh, and business interest as well. I thought we might, if we have time, to take a, a question or two from the audience for our panelists. If we have any. Let's see if I can see. In the front here. So the question is, what, what future does the IRB have in this space? Yeah, there's actually a, a professor at Columbia Law School, uh, Ham, uh, Neil no, Hamburger is the last name, who, who claims that the, the IRB might even have violate our First Amendment uh, right to access information and to, and to, and to speak, you know, researchers, first researchers to speak, um, that um, I don't think has, has take, gotten a lot of traction among policymakers. But um, but there is quite a bit of I, I mean, uh, one concern I have for privacy regulation in general and IRB uh, specifically is that it does significantly can add to costs and um, you know transaction costs should not be the sorts of things that are um, ignored it, it significantly impedes uh, research and um, and so to the extent that the IRBs are doing a good job though of making sure that there are some policies in place. Uh, to make sure that data that is risky in some way does not uh, leave the, uh, the researcher's hands, um, they probably are adding some value, but um, they are probably also adding significant costs, and I tend to see the costs as, a, as a, um, heavier than they should be and need to be right now. I mean, I'll comment in general, I think just in overall terms, the, there's you know, a legacy heritage with a lot of legacy that was built in the world of locks and picks. And the way to strike a balance where data is moving and being protected is a mind shift change. One of the things we're working through is to come up with a collective taxonomy of here's all the way data moves, in, independent of how it's used. So there's access, there's sharing, there's control, there's deletion, all these things sequence up. And they're all interdependent. And so from an education perspective, we're trying to get people uh, much more sensitized into the interdependencies. So the right to be forgotten has second-order consequences, first-order consequences. And just so that the data and the points of view can start to be seen of how all these various control points in the data and value flows start to drive policy um, is, I think, a point of enlightenment. I think there's also recognition that if you just lock down, control, and protect that there is starting to be an economic consequence. And so given the need for overall economic growth, there's a general awakening to let's at least listen to models where you can strike both. And then just to kind of go back to we're going to need clinical trials. We we can't just figure this out in sessions like this. We've got to have some real-world use cases and figure it out bit by bit. Um, but I think there's, there's a, 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 a mental model shift that's beginning to occur, and this could be one of these deals where a clear view and a short distance aren't the same thing, <laughs> but it, it could take a while before we get there. Well, it's, it's early in this conversation, but I think we have, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very glad both of you are diving in uh, with both feet uh, to, to engage with this because this is something we have to get right uh, very, very soon. I think that's all the time we have for now, but thank you very much, and thanks to our panelists today. Thank you. Thank you.